ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Thrasher's Paradise. Today joining us over Skype, we have Jeff and Dave. They are two members of the band Neck of the Woods from Vancouver. They just released a brand new album, The Anks of Fire, or Ire. Damn it. <laughs> Annex O Fire is what it is. It's the Annex O Fire. Yes, the Annex O Fire. Fire, damn it. <laughs> the sad thing is, though, I have it on my laptop right now, and I'm looking right at it, and I know there's not an F. <laughs> it happens a lot. <laughs> Anyways, gentlemen, how are you both doing on this fine quarantine Monday? Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good, man. It's relaxed. Easy day. Yeah. It's beautiful and sunny here in Vancouver. Yeah, no complaints. Excellent. Now, what's it? How bad is it in Vancouver? It's uh, pretty bad. From what I understand of Ontario, it's considerably more mild. There's, like, as I'm looking out my window, there's not very many people out. There's streets are pretty empty. Grocery stores are well stocked. But for the most part, it seems like people are staying inside. Yeah, about the same. Yeah, yeah. Now let's get into the fun part of the actual physical interview. That's talking about the brand new album, which came out March 20th? Yeah. Yeah, so what was it like to finally have the new album released? <laughs> it uh, was great because we were waiting a long time, as it uh, usually happens. But, uh, you know, you're always excited to release your latest and greatest material and always represent the time and uh, where you're at with uh, personal life and band and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, once you sort of sign to a label, uh, even though you may be ready to release it, it has to fit in with their releases as well. So you may not have to, uh, you may not get it out right away. Yeah, you, you got on a sit, you have to sit on it for a while. And so we did, but um, yeah, really happy with uh, the response to it so far and, uh, and the reviews and whatnot. So we're really proud of that album from a lot of different angles. So, uh, yeah, it feels great. Awesome. Now, how, excuse my French, but how shitty is it that this is all happening around the time of the release? <laughs> Absolute balls. Yeah. <laughs> it spent like a year developing a timeline for us that involved yeah. releasing an album within the week, playing South by Southwest, <laughs> doing some weekend warrior gigs in the States to get our American visas so we could tour the States freely. Within a week of that, touring with Misery Signals, and then a bit of time off, then two festivals, and a month-long tour, and all of that is scrapped. So we're a very DIY band as well, so it, fortunately we didn't, uh, we didn't take any huge financial hit with COVID. We were really lucky in that regard. We weren't already on the road. Like a lot of bands who were already on tour and had to call it and like go home, that would have been a real bummer. But we, you know, we were three days away from flying to Austin, Texas, and had to had to call it quits. So it's just been a bit of a bummer, you know. It's we're very proud of our release and we're really excited about it, but we really want to play it because now we haven't really played it live yet. So now what? A lot of bands have been doing over this time have been doing live stream concerts or even Q and A's. Could we see Neck of the Woods possibly do one of those two within the next couple of months? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We're going to start doing some more live stream stuff, I think. Um, even just uh, like we did one on Instagram, just me and Jeff hanging out, although we couldn't both get on there at the same time, but we just took <laughs> turns. Um, it's hard to figure out the live stream logistics stuff when, you know, we're also not supposed to all be in the same room together. So I'm not really sure, you know, we're because of the uncertainty and whatnot, we don't know if that's cool or like, or people are going to chirp at us about doing something like that. So you may see some individual um, playthroughs of the set and stuff like that. And um, so, yeah, we'll definitely, we're all sort of uh, have our thinking caps on. So what else we can do to keep, keep active and relevant with all the new stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Now, with all this going on, is now like the most crucial part of the band's career to really make a social media impression? Uh, like of bands as a whole? I'm not really sure. I feel like if you're inactive, you may fall by the wayside, but it's these are such uncharted territories that it's pretty difficult to navigate even when you already have a firm grasp on your social media, which a lot of bands do and, and like we're pretty on top of. But 
I'd say if you didn't already have it going, I wouldn't stress too hard about setting it up now. But you probably have all the time in the world to do so, so you might as well. Excellent. Now, I'm looking at the cover for the brand new album. I just want to know, what made you want to choose this cover art for the album? Uh, we were really lucky to work with an artist that uh, has been a good friend of mine for a number of years. Um, he is a tattooer named Arlen French here in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, he had two pieces on display in the shop that he works at, um, That I, one of which I had seen and thought, like, that very well could be our album cover. We can contemplated buying it off of him and, and opened a dialogue with him. Uh, in the past, I've, generally speaking, handled almost all of the art and design and that kind of stuff for the band. Like, I worked directly with the designer to do the last cover and uh, of The Passenger, our previous record, and... and kind of wanted to let my hands off the reins a little bit more for it, having done most of the design work. So to just give him our record, Dave and I sat down with him and kind of agreed on a few things that we didn't like and then showed him reference of things we did like and just showed him the album and said, you know, what do you think it looks like? He gave it a handful of listens and he got back to us. I think he, I think his reply was it's it looks like Unrelenting Fury and gave us this like wolf painting that was insane. So like, yeah. Okay, awesome. That's what it looks like. And uh, pretty quickly, I immediately had an idea of how I wanted to lay out the album, doing all the package design and stuff like that to kind of make it thematically continuous and as timeless as possible. And fortunately, his painting fit well with that. So we, we got really lucky with that one in that we were able to work with such a talented person. Excellent. Now, from an, a writing standpoint, Compared to The Passenger and your Neck of the Woods back in 2015, what makes this album different from the others? Uh, it's uh, definitely, we did a lot uh, more pre-production with this album. And so I think this album is a lot more thought out in a sense of the songwriting and, uh, and the riffs and whatnot. And The Passenger had more of, uh, more of a jammy vibe when the songs were written. It was, you know, we were going through some members and whatnot, so we were in the jam space a lot, just putting riffs together and playing songs, and and that definitely works, and that's definitely a way to do it. But um, yeah, with the uh, with the Annex of Ire, we laid everything out a little bit more and listened to it a lot more critically, and sort of made ch made changes uh, where they needed to be. And but that said, we kind of had an idea in mind of when we wanted to record what we kind of wanted this album to sound like, and sort of find that balance between, um, you know, uh, polished metal production, but also still sounding like five guys jamming, um, you know, not, not necessarily over the top on the, on the click and all that sort of stuff, even though it is on the grid, but we took more sections of songs rather than uh, going note by note. Excellent. Now compared to the other bands in the Vancouver metal scene, what makes Neck, Neck of the Woods different? Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Um, well, Jeff, I guess, for one, as a front man. <laughs> um, I don't know. We've always, like, it's always kind of been an underlying thing for me personally, it, writing music to sound different, but also familiar. You know, like, we just didn't want to be a stock sounding band. So we kind of go out of our way to write riffs that aren't necessarily... Um, you know, a certain chord progression long or whatever. Um, and we definitely draw influences from certain bands and that reflect, and you hear it in our music, but um, I guess we just always wanted to stand out in, uh, in a way. And luckily we have all the guys who can um, uh, help us do that because we all have such individual talents that, uh, you know, gel together and sort of become neck of the woods, especially live, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. Now, when this whole quarantine thing is all over and social gatherings are allowed to happen again, as a band, where would be the first venue you would want to perform at? Would want to or are going to be? <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> we, um, we, we were supposed to be leaving on tour with Misery Signals End and Chamber uh, on April 30th, and that was just recently rescheduled to be in November. So currently, our our most recent, our upcoming gig will be Calgary. I think is the soonest one, or I think maybe it's Edmonton. 
Um, but yeah. to be totally truthful, man, even if it wasn't for those two gigs, probably Calgary or Edmonton, because those two cities have always been really good to us, and there's a handful of great venues that are a lot of fun. Um, just because it's been so long since we've all like touched other people, I personally would want to play like a floor show at Tubby Dog or something, and say, which is like a hot dog stand in uh, Calgary. And it's we've played there once before, and it is is a, a pile of people all climbing over top of each other, and it's wild and chaotic and fun and exciting. Um, so I would pick something that's as small and intimate as possible, just to you know make up on lost time when it comes to crowd surfing and stage diving and all the fun stuff that comes with shows. We've actually played a considerable amount of like small all ages shows that weren't in venues. Like, yeah, Tubby Dog in Calgary, which is like a hot dog burger restaurant that has shows inside all ages. Ike's Sandwich Shop in Chico, California, which was a sandwich shop that has all ages shows in like the corner, tiny ass corner. Uh, uh, and then. Redding, uh, California? Uh, Redding? What, what was that, Redding? The Concrete Lodge, that skate shop. Yeah, yeah, inside the skate shop there. Um, oh, there was one other one that came to mind too. Oh, uh, like, aside from like the house party and stuff. But uh, yeah, house party in Victoria. But yeah, so we're we're no stranger to the weird thirty kids going crazy DIY show that isn't necessarily at a bar, <laughs> and, and it's always a fun change up. You know, and the kids. Perf- sorry, sorry. Go no, ahead. you go. You, you, no, you go. Oh, I was just going to mention how it's so different with those kids when they're not trying to impress anybody, and you may not even be the greatest band, but those kids just want to have a great time and slam monster energy drinks and just rock out uh, from start to finish during every band set. Um, so it's cool. It's a different different vibe than everybody standing there like this watching. Exactly. No, I was just going to ask, have you ever performed in a Thai, Thai food restaurant? No, we played in an Indian food restaurant. Was, yeah. that, was, that, was that Indian food or was that? Yeah. Indian and Olympia played in the Indian food restaurant. And we also played at King Wa in oh, uh, food Bend. Restaurant. Oh, yeah. We, uh, yeah. In any cuisine, we'll play at any type of restaurant. No problem. <laughs> Get us in there. Because <laughs> I know in Guelph, Ontario, there's a restaurant called the Red Papaya that puts on uh, metal shows. And it's this high food restaurant that the restaurant part stays open throughout the entire show. So yeah. it's cool to see people moshing and then that one guy in the corner eating Thai food. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll play. Yeah, we'll play. <laughs> Well, like, in exchange for a meal, we'll call it a draw. <laughs> that, that's all we ask. <laughs> Feed us. <laughs> I don't know why I can't stop laughing. That's just... Because it must be great Thai food, and you're like, I'm going to set this show up and make sure they actually do it. We no, will. I, can't, I can't actually talk about the restaurant. It is good food. Nice. I will admit that. Yeah, there. Right Except on. Roll through Guelph. Yes. You got to make sure to hit the Kitchener Guelph part of Ontario. Yeah. It's a good did, metal scene play, there. We did play Guelph in 2018, but I don't remember. It was a venue that was upstairs. So I don't remember uh, what it was called. District? Oh, uh, yeah. It was, yeah, it was district. district. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's now closed. Oh, oh dang. Sure. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. It's the same story out here, man. Venues are closing left, right, and center. I mean, pre-coronavirus yeah. thing. It's keeping mm-hmm. a venue afloat for live bands is kind of tricky. It is. Like, when I first started this, like, back last May, it was like there was a lot of venues, and now, like, half of the venues I've interviewed bands in have closed down. And it's like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a fleeting commodity, that's for sure. It is. Now, what, I do want to ask one last thing before we get into the funner questions. Um, I saw your post you made yesterday about the new long sleeve shirt. Yeah. Just want, it's very beautiful. Thanks. I like it. You're welcome. Now, do you hope that the sales would kind of go up with this whole going on? Uh, yes, of course. We always want to sell more merch. It's... Uh... You know, for, I'm sure sure that everybody who watches this and listens is probably very aware that most bands that tour as much as they can make all of their income off of selling merch. Um, usually in playing gigs, you get like a 
couple hundred bucks so you can make it to the next city and you can cover your gas, which is always important. But selling merch is like how we make money. And not that, you know, very obviously you don't play in a metal band to get rich and make money and all that. But if we want to record another record, we have to pay for it ourselves. If we want to, we just bought a trailer. Like we, we need to change the tires on the van, that kind of stuff. That's where buying merch really helps us out because it keeps yeah, yeah. us from personally going into financial debt, in which case a couple of us in the band have done so that the band can be afloat. Uh, so when people buy t-shirts, it is like we're eternally grateful. It is so, so helpful. Um, and we absolutely love the support. So, and you know, they've gone up a fair amount. Um, the tricky thing is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of people are in the same boat. Every band is like, hey, buy our merch. Hey, buy our... we're still a pretty small scale band in comparison. Um, but our, the response has been incredible. And we're super lucky and grateful. Thanks for looking at the long sleeve. I appreciate it. I do all of our merch myself and I personally mail them all out. So if anybody has bought any CDs or any stuff like that from our band camp, that's come straight from my apartment and the world of fun. In fact, my dog has probably sat on the t-shirt that you ordered. So heads up. <laughs> so the dog hair is a bonus basically is what you're saying yeah in fact like if you could paypal us an extra 10 bucks if you get one that's covered in my dog's hair that would be appreciated because it is <laughs> that guy. excellent now i'm gonna ask two fun questions first one is simple now a lot of metal a lot of the metal community has started producing their own kinds of beers iron maiden with the trooper a band from Calgary, Hyperia, with their own beer, Hyperia. If Neck of the Woods were to come out with their own beer, what kind of beer would it be, and what would be the name of it? Oh, man. I've actually been thinking about this, because there's a brewery in the East Coast that's called Neck of the Woods. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'd love to do a collaboration with them and call it, like, the Annex of Ale or something like that. Annex of Ale. A classic pale, like a, a session pale ale. You know, a beer that isn't too wild or crazy that like is a go-to you could drink six of them and be like yeah that's a good beer yeah probably the annex of ale because you know the addition of ale like i i would probably drink too many of them so it seems seems right that's awesome Man, that's already an awesome name oh thanks now that's <laughs> patent pending so anyone out there watching had better back right up because i'm doing that <laughs> that's coming <laughs> their next venture I've seen a few bands doing hot sauce as well, which I really liked. I bought hot yeah, sauce from yeah. the band Psychroptic, uh, and that was pure fire. It was unbelievably hot, like ruined my mouth. But I love the band Hot Sauce. That's a great, a great sale. But where yeah, we're man. really gonna make our killing is on the sparkling water, the Neck of the Woods signature <laughs> sparkling water. <laughs> yes, this is the real thing. There was a time when the when the band space when the when the jam space fridge was full of beer. There was a time. That time is gone. Now it's just sparkling water, lime, blueberry, pomegranate, whatever. But yeah, sparkling water, ice cold in the jam space all day long. That's where the real refreshment is. Yeah. None of this beer stuff. Come on. He's, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. There's that company in the states called Liquid Death that does that like metal. Oh brick. yeah hand water yeah right we should do a collab really, with them really. yeah oh that's awesome well they work <laughs> with with bands like behemoth you know like oh okay. huge bands so us being like yo let's do a signature can is probably going to go by the wayside but maybe we'll start our own direct competition yeah, why not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go for it and one last question. We usually ask this to every band that comes on. We call it a poser question. It's to ensure I'm not just talking to two random guys from Winnipeg. Because <laughs> you never know when you're going to talk to two random guys from Winnipeg. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so the question is simple. Who would win in the fight? Lemmy or God? Trick question. Trick question. God. Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> 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 I still get sad. Sorry, I still get satisfied when people answer it correctly. Nice. That's no well. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and Dan, thank you both so much for coming on Thrasher's Paradise today. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the people watching this? 
Uh, just give the Annex of Ire a good spin. It's a great record that we're really proud of. So uh, toss it on, go for a walk around the block, don't touch people, and uh, enjoy that album because we're really proud of it. Excellent. Yeah. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, keep on thrashing. Right on. Keep on Thanks, thrashing. Buddy. See you, dude. Searching for soulless and my dream.